So hi guys, uh, today our speaker is Luca De La Pritas from uh, University of Chicago. He's going to talk about uh, hydrodynamic fluctuations in quantum field theories and conformal field theories. Uh, this is the uh, talk number 102 in the series. Uh, uh, you can uh, all the speak all the participants can ask question in between if you have any question you don't need to take any permission from me don't write anything in the chat box because it is not possible for to uh, like both of us like the speaker and me to look in the chat box on this just directly ask the question if you have any problem from your end type it i will try to come with the question to the speaker uh, anyways, Luca, thank you for agreeing to give this talk for this forum, um, uh, and uh, you can start. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot, Santan. Uh, it's, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to speak here at this uh, very prolific uh, seminar series. Uh, it's too bad I didn't make it to the 100th, but 102 is pretty good. Uh, so, so yeah, I'll talk about uh, hydrodynamic fluctuations, various aspects of them, um, and in particular, so, so what, what these things are, are fluctuations of conserved densities and currents. And these occur in any interacting system at finite temperature. And I'll focus on their um, consequences in quantum field theories and uh, conformal field theories. So um, I'll, I'll define what, uh, what these things are in a bit, but just so that you know where we're going, um, we'll, we'll see that there are situations where hydrodynamic fluctuations are weak or strong, depending on if interactions between hydrodynamic fields are relevant or irre uh, irrelevant or relevant. And, um, and generically, weak fluctuations occur in, in space, spatial dimensions equal to two and larger. So in this talk, D will always be the space dimension, um, because you know, when you're working at finite temperature, it, it's a bit more convenient. Uh, whereas in, in one spatial dimension, so in one plus one dimensions, um, we will typically have strong hydrodynamic fluctuations. So when hydrodynamic fluctuations are weak, um, I'll show that one can use hydrodynamics as, a, as an effective field theory. And this is a pretty pretty old topic, but I'll show a new application of this uh, effective field theory. Um, in particular, I'll show how one can extract CFT data in, um, in 2 plus 1D, 3 plus 1D in, in higher dimensions from, from hydrodynamics. So for example, um, OPE coefficients involving heavy operators uh, in terms of this hydrodynamic effective field theory. Uh, and on, on, on this side, so when hydrodynamic fluctuations are strong, here um, we'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, one plus one dimensional quantum field theories where, where this occurs. And, um, and we'll see that there's a lot of, yeah, we'll see that there's a lot of special things happening in one plus one dimensions. Um, and, and this will be uh, on this, this recent paper. Okay, so let's, let's um, start with the um, introduction. I, I have a question uh, uh, in the previous slide. Uh, so you, you oh, yeah. strong uh, fluctuations. Uh, the yeah. dispersion relation is a specific type. It's KPZ hydro. Is it always yes. the same? Is, is uh, it's it's it. Uh, yeah, good question. So it's going to be the case. Um, it, it's uh, going to be the case in, in most situations of interest. But there are um, some some situations where so so basically whenever you have a ballistic mode like a sound mode. Um, uh, in, in one plus one dimension, this will have this type of, of KPZ dispersion relation because of the strong hydrodynamic fluctuations. There are some kind of weird situations where you could have something a bit different, but it would involve, so, so it, you can kind of make kind of condensed matter models or, or th that have other types of dispersion relations. I'll, I'll mention this in a bit, but in most of kind of the quantum field theories that will be, you know, that are of interest for us, like regular global symmetries and you know Poincaré symmetries. Uh, this is what's going to happen. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions on the general uh, on this first slide? And what about this weak uh, fluctuation case? Uh, the yeah. relation is not universal or something like that. I don't know. It is. Sorry. Yeah, I should have written it down. So if you have something like a sound mode, the the uh, the width of it, it goes like k squared. So this is usual kind of diffusive behavior. This is what happens usually in hydrodynamics. Sometimes you have a diffusive mode even where the speed of sound is zero. But for a regular sound mode, like when I'm talking to you, this is how it's dispersing. The width is k So squared. this is the diffusion coefficient or something? Yeah, this is a, exactly. This is the diffusion constant. Oh, okay, okay. Something like a diffusion constant. And, and this is what changes in, uh, in, uh, in 1 plus 1. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, thanks for that question. Okay, so for, for some background, um, so any interacting system, um, whether it's quantum or classical, will be described by some form of hydramics at, at late times. So hydramics is a, a late time effective description of, of, um, of basically any interacting system. And which type of hydramic theory you should use just depends on the global symmetries or the number of conserved quantities uh, the, uh, in your in your and the type of conserved quantities in your system, um, and so you know depending on the situation, uh, you, if you just have conserved energy or charge, like in a, a lattice model, you might you might just get diffusion. Um, in the cases we'll be interested in, there's also going to be conserved momentum, and there you have things like the Navier-Stokes equation. So what's really um, uh, surprising or, or fascinating here is that uh, hydramics is completely blind to the microscopic details. It only cares about the global symmetries. And the description you get up to a few coefficients that might depend on the theory is, is extremely universal. So the first question that comes to mind is, how is such a universality possible? And we don't really have a proof of the emergence of hydramics in, in, in many interacting systems. We have some examples where, where we know it works well, but we definitely think it's true. Uh, so the, the explanation is, is a bit uh, intuitive, but not, but not very technical. And the kind of intuitive explanation is that uh, at finite temperatures, most excitations relax with some time scale that I'll call the thermalization time or equilibration time. Um, except for things that can't relax because of, of conservation laws. So for example, the total charge in the system cannot you know, relax in a, in a, in, yeah, because it's conserved. And so uh, likewise, long wavelength modulation of conserved densities, like a current density, for example, uh, can't relax too fast because you know, its time derivative is gonna be the gradient of something and it's a very, uh, it's a very um, small, small wave vector. And so the decay rate of these excitations will be parametrically small. So they're gonna decrease with their wave vector. Um, for example, in a diffusive system. So for small enough wave vector, long enough distances, these will be parametrically slower than generic excitations. And the system becomes pretty simple because you can describe it only in terms of these hydramic quantities. So hydrodynamics is the late time description of these coarse grained densities. Um, so we'll have current densities, stress tensor, things like that. So let's see uh, the how it works in the simplest example. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have a question. So like, uh, I can understand that you can apply this uh, hydrodynamic description provided the time mm -hmm. scale is basically greater than your thermalization uh, time scale. Uh, yes. But achieving the thermalization is itself a very complicated task for different yes. theory system. So could you please comment on that a little bit? Yes. So th th that's right. Maybe let me give some examples on um, on on this. So so this is the the time scale. This local uh, thermalization or equilibration time scale. I'll sometimes call it equilibration time. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to separate it from the global uh, equilibration time scale, which is the time scale for even hydramic things to decay, yes. uh, which is sometimes called the Thales time. So that's a much later time, the Thales time. Um, Firstly, Thales also starts with th. And I'll just write Thales, which will go like. Um, which will go like system size squared in a diffusive system. So, so that's a much later time scale. Here, this, this equilibration time is the time scale for local equilibration. And indeed, as Santan um, mentioned, the process for local equilibration is, it can be quite complicated. Uh, in a weakly coupled system, we kind of understand it. We have this Boltzmann picture, a kinetic theory of you know, a part of particles or quasi-particles colliding, and eventually uh, there is a kind of mean free time. So in the context of mean free, uh, of, of weakly coupled system, this uh, equilibration time uh, would be the this this mean free time, mean free time of, of quasi particle scattering, and, and so this will go like uh, this will be parametrically long because if you're at weak coupling, you need to wait a long time. So it's going to go like one over some coupling, um, uh, typically, uh, let's say in units of of, uh, of one over temperature. Uh, and, and there we can really compute it. We can see hydrodynamics emerge, but but it's still a hard calculation. Now, in strongly coupled systems, it's much harder to, to understand you know, the process of thermalization. Uh, we, we do see it, for example, in holography, there we understand that this time scale, we can kind of associate it with quasi-normal modes, non-hydramic quasi-normal modes. And there it's usually of order one over T. Um, this is what's sometimes called a Planckian, Planckian time scale. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the idea is that you know, you, this coupling, so, so this, is, this is much bigger than one over T at weak coupling, and you could crank up the coupling to make it to make it um, uh, smaller and smaller this time scale, but there's a kind of limit. There's a kind of idea that there's a, a limit on thermalization. Uh, and I'll talk more about this, especially in the 2D context. 
Um, so there, the process of thermalization, it's, yeah, it's hard to say much about it in generic theories. Let's say strong interaction theories that are not holographic, but, but what we can say a lot about is hydrodynamics. So the theory that emerges after that, after that process, that complicated process happens. Okay. Okay. But I won't say much about the process itself, except in, in 2D where, where I can say a few more things. So once you apply this hydrodynamic description, you assume that already the thermalization happened. Exactly. Yeah. So it's 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 an effective field theory. So it has a regime of validity, and it's only going to be valid for time scales much larger than this local equilibration time. Yes. And I assume I assume that it happens. Yeah. So you know it might not happen, and, and, and well, we think it always happens in situations that in, in field in theories that are not integrable uh, or not free that don't have you know an extensive number of conserved uh, quantities. Yeah. Um, we we believe it happens, but we yeah it's you for generic theory you can't you can't prove it usually. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for the other question. So, so let's see how um, hydrodynamics works in the simplest example where I have a single, a single uh, say, U1 symmetry. So then I'll have just a conservation law for the current. Uh, and my density will be my, my slow uh, degree of freedom. OK, its time derivative is small at, at small wave vector. Now, this conservation law also involves the current, um, the, the, the spatial component of the current which itself is not a slow operator. The time derivative of this operator is not suppressed by gradients. Um, but the idea of effective field theory is that we can, we can express any operator in terms of our slow, effective, you know, low energy degrees of freedom uh, in the regime of validity of the effective field theory, so at late times. So the idea is to write down the most general expression we can for this current in terms of the density, which is our degree of freedom. And we'll do this in a gradient expansion because we're interested in the long distance physics. And so the leading term we can write down, um, current is a vector, so we need a, a gradient here, is this, is this term here. And so if we close uh, these two equations, um, uh, we, we, we'll see that we get the diffusion equation. And this leads to, uh, so solving, um, uh, linearizing around some background density and solving for the fluctuations of charge density leads to the following uh, diffusive Green's function. So we see that it has a diffusive pole at omega equals uh, minus id k squared. Okay, so this is a single diffusive pole. This is the simplest theory of hydrodynamics you can get. And it describes you know, heat, uh, heat diffusion, for example. Um, so here, I wanna stress that there are two expansions happening. Uh, the first is a gradient expansion that I mentioned over here. And, and this gradient expansion is always controlled in principle. You know, if these gradients are suppressed by some length scale, we can always go to long enough distances so that higher gradient terms are, are going to be, give small corrections. But there's also uh, an expansion in fluctuations of the density itself. So to get this, this Green's function, you need to linearize around uh, uh, a background density. And uh, this, this is kind of like a tree level, you know, propagator for charge if you want. Um, but there could be corrections that involve fluctuations of density themselves. For example, the diffusion constant can depend on density. And then, you know, you'll have nonlinear terms. And this is a more subtle expansion. And we'll, this will be the main subject of this talk. And uh, we'll see that it's only controlled when interactions are irrelevant. Um, so before I go into these, these fluctuation effects, let me just show one other example of uh, a theory of hydrodynamics. Here we had a single diffusive mode. Uh, another very common type of mode is sound modes. And these occur, for example, in theories where you have conserved momentum, conserved energy and momentum, say. Um, so let's, let's say we have a quantum field theory that has uh, just the conserved conservation of the stress tensor. Um, uh, so this should be a new. So we have the, our slow modes will be the conserved densities. Um, Momentum, uh, momentum density and energy density. And sometimes people like to work instead with their associated potentials, temperature and, and velocity, but really, you know, so, so the, the, those are the degrees of freedom. There's one degree of freedom for every conserved density. Now, again, the conservation law involves the currents. So the spatial parts of the, the stress sensor, which themselves are not slow. So we need to, again, uh, write uh, down uh, an expression relate, relating these currents to these densities. And, uh, and especially in, in relativistic systems, people like to write it in terms of the potentials. And so this, this leads to this type of considered relation for the, for the stress tensor. So the first two terms, this is again in a gradient expansion. Here we have one order in gradient terms, and then there's gonna be higher order in gradient terms. The first two terms are the ideal form of the stress tensor. Uh, they involve coefficients that we'll call energy and pressure. Then there's this term that involves the bulk viscosity, shear viscosity, and so on. And so hydrodynamics kind of classifies all possible terms you can write down, but it doesn't tell you what these coefficients are. 
this might depend on the microscopics. Now, if you do the, if, one, yeah, of course. So the, for this gradient expansion and uh, once you are taking these fluctuations, so this, where for a particular hydrodynamic system, how do you actually decide that where to truncate? Where to truncate? Oh, um, yeah. Means you are taking uh, expansion, but somewhere you have to truncate. So otherwise, how you can fix this coefficient? So that's why my question, like, how you decide that? How do you decide where to truncate? Is the, is the question? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So the um, um, so so well, I, I guess there's two questions. There's the fluctuation expansion and the gradient expansion. Yeah, both. Yeah. yeah. So the fluctuation expansion will, uh, as we'll see, you. I, I think the, the the way to do it is you, you write down the first nonlinear term and you check if it's relevant or irrelevant. If it's relevant, you're in trouble and you have to do something else. It tells you that the whole expansion is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. And then if it's irrelevant, it's just a question of how how much precision you know, how many loops you want to compute things in. So it's like in quantum in like in effective field theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, this, and the gradient expansion is similar. It depends on the level of precision you want. Um, so, you know, let's say I compute a, court, let's say I compute a, a, a Green's function like I had here. Uh, this is approximate, you know, there's, there's plus dot, dot, dots. There will be, you know, further K squared corrections in the, so something like, you know, D tilled K to the four and so on, which are suppressed by, by this length scale, um, thermalization time or thermalization length. Um, so for K, you know, for K, L thermal much smaller than one, these will be small corrections. But if you want a bit more precision, they, they, they can be they can be useful. So it's a question of how precise you want to be. But here, um, I think qualitatively, it's pretty interesting to include the first uh, derivative terms and not just have the ideal stress tensor because that is what that's that's where dif uh, dissipation enters. And so it, it it does kind of qualitate you know it resolves delta function singularities in your Green's functions and uh, gives some width. Whereas including these next terms will just give you know, k, k to the three, k to the four corrections to these things. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so if we if we now take this uh, considered relation and plug it back in the in the conservation law, um, what this leads to is uh, two types of modes. Um, there's a diffusive mode again in the in here I'm I'm, I'm uh, writing down the momentum density Green's function. There's a diffusive mode in the transverse um, sector. Uh, and, and this diffusion constant is related to the shear viscosity. Uh, in fact, it's equal to, um, sorry. Eta over ST. Uh, and then we have a sound mode, and this is the usual sound mode of, um, you know, like in air, say. Uh, so there's a, a speed of sound, which depends on the equation of states on the details of your, of your quantum field theory. And there's a sound attenuation rate, which involves the, the bulk viscosity and the shear viscosity. So these are, this is what I was saying earlier, these first order in hydro things are resolving singularities and they're giving a width to these poles. So this is the type of modes that are very common in hydrodynamics and that I'll be talking about, sound and diffusion. Uh, and this is what they look like. So a diffusive mode, if you start with a, a kind of uh, little um, uh, bump in, in your density, it's going to diffuse away and relax um, with some rates given by, um, by K squared. Whereas the sound mode, it propagates uh, in, in some direction. And then the spreading of the, if you follow the pulse, it also spreads diffusively like K squared. And this is what the poles would look like. Um, sound poles have a real part and the diffusive pole has, a, has an imaginary part. So these appear all over the place. Uh, diffusion describes diffusion of heat, of particle number and spin, for example, in spin chains. Uh, sound describes you know, regular sound that we speak with, superfluid sound, spin waves, transfer sounds in, in, in solids. Uh, so they're, they're all over the place. And in particular, they appear in quantum field theories. Um, so, so those are the modes that I'll be talking about. There are other types of modes uh, that can exist in, in hydrodynamics in, in slightly more exotic um, situations, and then this goes back to Santan's question on if you can have something else than KPZ. So in these situations, you could have slightly more exotic things happening. Um, but I, I won't, uh, for the purpose of this talk, there's already a lot of interesting things to say about diffusive and sound modes, so I'll, I'll focus on, on these types of modes. So the central question I want to ask is when are interactions big? When are fluctuations of density big? So this was our diffusive diffusion equation. Okay, We had n dot minus d grad squared n uh, equals zero. This led to diffusion. So, so let's let's start with the the, diffu the diff case of diffusion. Now, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the diffusion constant itself can depend on charge, right? If you have a system and you change the 
background charge of your system, things can depend on that. And um, so, so because of this, we should really expand, you know, things like the diffusion constant as around the background density. And so this will lead to nonlinearities in the diffusion equation. So here I expanded this to, uh, D to, to, to linear order. Uh, and, and the first terms here are just the regular um, diffusion equation. So we'd like to know when this nonlinear term is important. Uh, and a way to, to know this, so there's a simple scaling argument to figure this out, uh, which I'll, I'll explain now. So um, uh, first we need to find how density scales, right? To compare, to compare this to the, to the kind of kinetic term. Uh, so, and, and this we can find by just looking at the density two point function. And in a diffusive system, this is what it looks like. So it looks like a Gaussian um, that, that spreads whose width uh, increases in time. And there's this overall power of time uh, that you can get by remembering that if you integrate charge density over all of space, you get a conserved charge. Uh, so it better, it better be constant, the two-point function. And that's indeed what integrating this Gaussian will give you. So here we see that the density two-point function at, at late times decays like one over t to the d over two. So this tells us that density scales like frequency to the d over four or k to the d over two. Omega scales like k squared because of this leading kinetic term. That's what happens in diffusion. So we see that a, a single diffusive, uh, um, a, a single delta n scales like scales like wave vector to the d over two. So if we go back to our equation here, so the the kinetic term omega scales like k squared. Here we have gradient squared, and here we have gradient squared plus a power of density. So it's going to scale like k to the two plus d over two. So here we see that at small wave vector, this is this is a larger power. So it's always more suppressed um, than than the leading kinetic term. Okay, as long as d is is positive, which which it always is when we're talking about diffusion. So uh, the bottom line is that um, fluctuations are basically not big in in diffusive systems, in systems that are purely diffusive. But now let's look at ballistic systems. So uh, a system that has we're, we're we're now considering a system that has a sound mode, like say like in in, in quantum field theories. Um, so a sound mode the the um, uh, dispersion relation looks, this is what the equation of motion for something like a density, a momentum density or, or so on uh, looks like. It's a linear ingredient and it has this diffusive spreading. Um, so before what we looked at is we expanded the, the diffuse, the you know sound attenuation coefficient or, or diffusive coefficient and found that it was irrelevant. But now we have a term that's that has one less gradient. So it's going to be a little more uh, dangerous. And let's look at what happens with this. So this is the speed of sound. Basically, the fact that the speed of sound, as I said, it can depend on the equation of state of your quantum field theory. And so it's going to depend on temperature, on you know, background density, and so on. And so it, it is going to depend on the hydrodynamic fields themselves. Um, and, and because of this, we should expand it. So the leading term will be again just uh, um, just uh, this this you know equation of motion for sound, and then we have this nonlinearity, which now has a single gradient. So let's try to figure out if this uh, term is relevant. Um, so here to 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 get a nice scaling, it's convenient to follow the pulse of sound. So I'm I'm going to just follow the pulse, work, work in coordinates where it's just spreading diffusively, so that um, this gets rid of the. Um, the leading term. This is what the, the equation looks like now. And now we can again scale omega like k squared in this frame because now it's just spreading diffusively. Um, but we have this linear ingredient uh, interaction. So like before, um, charge fluctuations in this frame will, will scale like omega to the d over four or k to the d, d over two. And so if I plug this in here, so my, my kind of kinetic term scales like k squared and the interaction has uh, a, um, uh, an extra power of charge, so it's k to the d over two, but it has a single gradient. So it's just k to the one plus d over two. So here we see that it's not always a larger power, okay? Uh, it's only um, a larger power if the spatial dimension is larger than two and, and fluctuations will be big uh, when the dimension, when the spatial dimension is smaller than two. Meaning interactions will be relevant uh, and, and they, they become more and more important than the kinetic term at low, uh, at, at long distances. And this tells you that there's a breakdown kind of in, in uh, perturbation theory. Higher and higher interactions will be more and more important. So uh, just to summarize, the bottom line is that we found diffusive modes always had weak hydramic fluctuations. Whereas in theories where you have ballistic modes, uh, their interactions are, are um, weak as long as the spatial dimension is larger than two. And they're strong when the spatial dimension is less than two. Uh, it turns out that when the dimension is equal to two, 
um, they're, they're still weak, so they're actually marginal, but that you can show that they're marginally irrelevant. Uh, and so you still have a kind of weakly coupled regular effective field theory of hydrodynamics in this case. Um, so it's really only in, in spatial dimensions equal to one where you have a, a, very, a qualitatively different uh, um, uh, situation. And, and, and in particular, this will apply to quantum field theories in one plus one dimension. I so we're, we're going to be focused. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, question. So, uh, the question is uh, regarding the uh, like uh, case where the D is zero. If it is a zero plus one yeah. dimensional model, like suppose it is a SYK yeah. type of model, such the type of yeah. model. So what yeah. happens to that? Because those models yeah. are applies and all those things we know, but like in that case, hydrodynamic yeah. description is not possible to write. I, I think there's just not much you would write because, uh, you, you know, here the, in this whole analysis, I had space uh, to analyze how things spread. Um, and so it doesn't really make sense in D strictly equal to zero. I don't know if you could like work in some kind of dimensional regularization and then say something, but you know, in, in quantum in quantum mechanics and in SYK and so on, if you have a conserved charge, it's just conserved and there's no local version of it. Okay. And what about the fra fractal dimensions, fractional dimensions? Yeah, so those those you can also also study uh, and, and two is really the critical dimension. So whenever, if you're in two minus epsilon, uh, then you have relevant, um, yeah, you have relevant interactions. And in particular, you can kind of access, you know, this KPZ uh, hydro that I'll talk about in a bit. You could access it perturbatively in working in in two in in two spatial dimension minus epsilon, okay. and kind of yeah reach the fixed point perturbatively. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So um, we'll be uh, focused on on quantum field theories in, in this talk, and, and these will always have ballistic modes. So this is the kind of relevant column. Uh, and, and two plus one is the separating dimension. Okay, so that's why I'll have kind of two separate parts to, to this talk. Um, so in the rest of the talk, I'll, 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 this was the intro, and, and we'll talk about situations where fluctuations are weak and fluctuations are strong. So as I said, they're weak in, in dimensions equal to two and larger. Um, and there we'll, we'll, we'll look at how uh, we can use hydramics as an effective field theory, in particular to extract um, CFT data. Um, in, in two plus one in high dimensions. Uh, and then um, in the end, we'll turn to strong uh, fluctuations in one spatial dimension. Uh, in, in one plus one D, CFTs are a bit uh, less, uh, they, have a, they don't have hydrodynamics um, because there are kind of too many symmetries for hydrodynamics. So to see interesting hydrodynamics, you have to look at quantum field theories. So you, you need to uh, deform your CFTs to, to, to see something interesting emerge in terms of hydrodynamics. And so there I'll talk about um, one plus one dimensional quantum field theories and we'll see uh, that one can prove a, um, an interesting thermalization bound um, using, using these ideas. Okay, so let's start with the weak fluctuations. So what we found is that um, fluctuations were irrelevant when the dimension was larger or equal to two. And what this means is that we have a, a systematic controlled expansion in, in, uh, in our hydrodynamic densities uh, and we can use it, you know, to to compute observables, correlation functions of our current, for example, or or things like this, uh, perturbatively. And you, there's a loop expansion, like in like in effective field theories. And this uh, this kind of dissipative effective field theory um, of hydrodynamics has been studied for for quite some time. Uh, it has a it has a pretty long history. Um, and the way uh, I'll just briefly mention how, how the the kind of how, how it was done er earlier. So uh, the way people um, did it in the past is that they introduced noise fields to, um, so, so this is a considered relation for your, for your current involves, in, involves these densities, but um, uh, um, you need to introduce a noise field to account for the fact that the current isn't exactly equal to, to, to the densities. And this, the fluctuations of this noise field um, uh, has, uh, is fixed by by the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So it's fixed by dissipation by the same diffusion constant that appears here. Um, so this is how kind of um, hydromix was done earlier. There's a, a more recent approach that is uh, pretty elegant and I think explains this this uh, introduction of noise fields in a way that's uh, pretty satisfactory to me. Um, um, so so here the, the, these noise field basically you had a, a doubling of degrees of freedom for every conserved density the effective field theory had an extra no a companion noise field. And the way to understand this in this modern approach is, is the following. Um, so we're, we're studying finite temperature, real-time finite temperature physics. 
Um, we're, we're, and the natural way to do this is on a schwinger kaldish contour because we want to uh, consider a, 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 a a density matrix, a thermal density matrix, in fact, and study real-time dynamics. And um, so on this contour, there's naturally going to be a doubling of degrees of freedom uh, on the upper leg and the lower leg of your contour. So basically the idea is you put your quantum field theory or your system, whatever it is, on, on the stringer kaldish contour. And at low energies, there's going to emerge an effective description in terms of hydramic fields. Uh, as you as you go to as you flow to lower energies, this will uh, introduce couplings between both legs of the contour, uh, and so your hydramic degrees of freedom. Th there's naturally going to be a doubling of them because they live both up and down, and and roughly speaking, the densities, the hydramic densities, corresponds to average values of these fields, so phi top plus phi bottom, whereas the noise fields, of course, from the previous approaches, correspond to differences in these in these fields. Um, so there's been a lot of activity recently in, in building these Springer Kaldish effective field theories. For the purposes of this talk, I won't need the details of these effective field theories. Um, I'll just be able, what we're going to do is simply expand operators in terms of, of densities and, and get correlation functions um, like this. So um, uh, basically, I'm going to use the fact that there exists a weakly coupled effective field theory uh, to, to uh, compute these correlation functions. And I'll illustrate this in a bit. In your description, what is uh, xi? This is a noise kind of thing? Yeah, this is a noise term. Uh, I, I think a nice way to see it is, is just like this. So you have in the stringer kaldish contour, you have you have um, you know you have fields living on the on the top and the bottom, and uh, these these noise fields are basically things that can that can um, uh, fluctuate but ha have zero expectation value. Um, so. Uh, uh, and this is exactly what this difference will have. So, uh, if you if you have say a correlation function um, that involves uh, th there's this latest time property on these stringer kaldish contours. If your if your latest if your field at the latest time is is uh, a difference, so something like phi top minus phi bottom. So you have a, a correlation function, and the latest time is is um, a, a noise field. This always vanishes because um, you know, because there's a trace here, so you you can just the, the both both uh, terms are are equal and they cancel. And in particular, it means that noise fields. If, if I just have a, a one point function of a noise field, it's zero. Whereas a one point function of a density, it's allowed to be a background value. So these um, yeah, so these 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 fields are basically uh, fluctuations that have zero expectation value. And uh, this noise you have taken these are white noise noise. I think from the correlation that you have written, but uh, what happened? Actually, there are there are interactions. Yeah, no. The, the, the leading order, it's 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 uh, you know, it has some kind of Gaussian statistics, but uh, there are interactions in this effective filter approach. There will be interactions involving the noise as well. Oh, okay. So there will be nonlinear terms. Yeah, yeah, there, and there's a nice structure to it. Um, but but the point is that if interactions are irrelevant in in you know, our analysis already tells us whether or not interactions are relevant and when we can apply this type of um, this type of approach. So we'll see that we don't really need these noise terms to, to figure out what correlation functions look like. Um, all we need to do is, it, let's say you're interested in some operator, um, say the current operator or, or some other operator, I'll expand it in my densities. And then I'll just, you know, if I want the two point function of, of a current, for example, I'll just use these expressions and compute uh, what they give me. So I'll have a tree level uh, contribution coming from the first term, I'll get a one loop correction coming from the second term, and so on. So we can just kind of wick contract our densities um, once we have uh, an expression like this. And the reason we can wick contract to leading order is because um, the effective field theory is is approximately Gaussian. So that's what we're that's what we're going to use. So let me let me show you uh, let me show you an example of this. Um, but let's. I'm going to present a, a, an interaction effect um, in the case of where you have conserved uh, momentum. Um, and, and this interaction effect goes under the name of long time tails, hydramic long time tails. So when we have, uh, let's say we have a quantum field theory, this is what our considered relation looks like. Um, here I'm, I'm only keeping the shear viscosity for, for simplicity. And uh, I, I really want you to think about these considered relations as, as operator matching equations. So I had said before that we have, you know, we have uh, slow densities, T0, 0, and T0i. And the currents are, are not slow, but we can write them in terms of slow densities. 
So really what this considered relation is, even though we wrote it in a kind of Lorentz covariant way, it's a way to relate Tij to the, the momentum and energy densities. And so I can rewrite it, in fact, in this way. Uh, that makes it even more um, uh, apparent. And, and this way of thinking will be very useful uh, later when we'll talk about other operators uh, than, than conserved currents. We'll also be able to follow a similar approach. So here I just rewrote the same considered relation. Uh, this diffusion constant again is related to the, to the shear viscosity. Uh, and, and this is what, what TIJ looks like, okay? Uh, and, and so this is, you should think of as an effective operator equation. So it's of course not true if you give me a quantum field theory that TIJ is related to T0i in this way, right? This is not a, a microscopic operator equation. But the point is that it's an effective operator equation at finite temperatures and, and late times. So in the effective field theory, it's, a, it's an operator equation. And what this means is that the correlation functions of, of operators of either side. So if I take either the, the left-hand side or the right-hand side and put it in correlation functions, these correlation functions will match in the infrared. So let's see a consequence of this, this operator matching equation and in particular this, this nonlinear term. So um, here we, we see that uh, um, at finite wave vector, TIJ, TIJ overlaps with the hydramic density. And so its correlation function will involve hydramic poles, okay? Because it just mixes with the hydramic density, basically. That zero wave vector, this, uh, this goes to zero. If I send wave vector to zero. And so there's no more linear overlap. So you might expect TIJ to just be a fast operator that decays exponentially. But this would be ignoring this nonlinear term. Um, so it does, it does kind of interact with two hydramic densities. Um, uh, which will control the late time correlation function of TIJ. So the picture is that TIJ is some kind of composite operator, which can decay into two stress tensors, two, two momentum densities. And this, will, this loop will control um, the, uh, the, the late time correlation function of, of TIJ. So to compute this, you simply, so let's say we want to compute the two point function of TIJ at zero wave vectors. I simply plug in this expression and we contract the momentum densities. So here I just use the correlation functions I had given you earlier. Uh, that involve sound and, and diffusion. And what you find is that um, if, you, if you perform this loop integral is that you get a polynomial decay of TIJ. So it's not, it's not exponential as one might have you know, naively expected from the fact that it's not overlapping with, um, with conserved densities, uh, but it's polynomial. And this, this slow decay goes under the name of hydramic long time tails. So it's an example of, of loop effects in hydrodynamics. And so these uh, were actually discovered a, a very long time ago. They were discovered in uh, numerics, in classical numerics. Um, people were studying you know, molecular dynamics in classical numerics, and they were studying correlation function um, of, of currents and found that they, uh, that they decayed much slower than expected. They expected um, exponential and they got polynomial. Uh, and, and the theory uh, soon followed and explained, uh, explained this, this slow decay. Uh, it's all, it also occurs in, in quantum systems, and it's been seen in a number of uh, quantum situations. Uh, it's been shown, it's been seen in holography. It's also been seen in um, numerics on one-dimensional lattices using exact diagonalization. Um, so, so here, lattices have different, slightly different symmetries. There's no conserved momentum, but there's still this concept of hydronic long time tails. The power laws are a bit different. And there's been some interest recently in it for, for its possible relevance for heavy ion collisions. Um, you know, because it gives it gives a correction to the leading hydramic answer, which is uh, which which might have which might be important uh, at the time scales where where we observe these uh, the quark gluon plasma. Um, okay, so that that's a, a, an example of an interaction effect in in hydrodynamics. Uh, let me let me maybe skip this part. Good. So so uh, now I'd like to use this effective field theory uh, and this approach to to study. Um, to study CFT. And the, the, the idea is that um, uh, heavy operators in CFTs, in interacting CFTs, create a thermal state so that if I put a light operator in it, uh, it's going to, um, you know, it's going, well, correlation functions in this thermal state will be described by hydrodynamics. And so um, uh, I'll have a, basically a hydrodynamic prediction for what, for what um, light operators look like in this thermal state. So let, let's let's go into that. Are there are there any questions uh, before I go into um, the CFT data? Okay. If not, let's let's go. So so the strategy is the following. 
Um, so here now we're in, we're in, um, in two plus one dimensions or higher, so three plus one and so on. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we're interested in CFTs because they're, they're, they're you know, sim simpler examples of, of, of quantum field theories. And we'll see that, that hydramics has uh, leads to strong constraints on, on some of the CFT data. So the idea is the following. Uh, in a thermal state, correlation functions of simple operators, let's say light operators in CFT language, at late times will be controlled by hydrodynamics. Now, um, this correlation function, we can think of it microcanonically as a sum over highly excited states uh, in some in some microcanonical window. And these highly excited states in a CFT can be created by heavy operators. Okay, so this is going to be a sum over, over such four-point functions. And finally, I can uh, introduce a complete state of, set of uh, states in the middle of this correlation function. Um, uh, to, to uh, kind of extract the, the time dependence. Uh, and this will lead to a sum over um, some OP coefficient squared. It's going to be dominated by, by exchanged uh, heavy operators, heavy prime. So here we see that at least indirectly, hydrodynamics will have some uh, thing, something to say about CFT data. Um, but it's a bit complicated to directly extract expressions for CFT data because there's these two sums over microcanonical uh, windows. But on the other hand, we expect um, strongly coupled systems to not really, you know, to kind of be self-averaging and not really need all these sums. Um, and, and this expectation goes under the name of the eigenstate formalization hypothesis, which is basically an ansatz for uh, matrix elements of simple operators in chaotic systems, um, in, in, in uh, highly excited energy eigenstates. And this ansatz, basically the, the content of it is, is to say that, that um, things are self-averaging. Um, so it, what it looks like is that it says that matrix elements are approximately diagonal in highly excited states. The diagonal part has to reproduce the thermal expectation value of this light state, of this light operator in the thermal state, at a temperature related to the energy of the heavy state through the equation of states. Um, so, so this equation is, if you average it over a microcanonical window, it's just obvious. It's, it's obviously true. It's just the correspondence between microcanonical and canonical. Uh, ensemble. But, um, but the statement of ETH is that you don't even need to average, is that it's, it's going to be basically true at the level of individual energy agencies. And then there's an off-diagonal part, which is um, uh, basically random and, and very small, so exponentially small. Uh, and, and it's suppressed by the density of states, which is very large in the, you know, at high energies. And the variance of this kind of random, of these random fluctuations is controlled by the two-point function of the light operator in the thermal state. Okay, and this is where hydrodynamics will enter. Hydrodynamics will control th this two-point function. Thermodynamics will control this, and hydrodynamics will control this. So here we see that off-diagonal heavy, heavy light, you know, OP coefficients, which give these matrix elements, will be controlled by hydrodynamics in a, in a pre-direct way. We, we barely need to, to average um, to, to get this connection if we, if we assume ETH. So a question you might have here is, okay, so here we have we have a nice connection between um, OP coefficients and, and two-point functions, but which two-point functions are controlled by hydrodynamics? Is it only the ones of conserved currents and stress sensors? And the answer is no. Um, and, and that's another uh, of the main points I, I wanted to make in this, in this paper. Um, so um, it, it turns out that essentially any uh, operator that's neutral, so that doesn't carry internal quantum numbers, will have the same you know, quantum numbers as composites of stress tensors and so on. And so it's going to be allowed to decay into hydrodynamic excitations. So the same way that we wrote down a considered relation for Tij in terms of, of um, composites of the, the densities, we can do that for any operator as long as it's neutral um, because nothing forbids it by symmetries. And so we'll, we'll write down considered relations that look like this. We'll have an expansion in powers of densities and these will control the correlation functions of this, of this operator. So for example, in the, in the 3D Ising model, um, what I'm saying is that any heavy operator that is Z2 even um, uh, will, be, will be, its correlation function will be controlled by, by hydrodynamics. The Z2 odd ones won't because they have a quantum number that can't be reproduced by the effective hydrodynamic degrees of freedom. Okay, so to summarize, um, uh, the, the, the strategy, heavy operators uh, create a thermal state um, 
in this thermal state, correlation functions of light operators are controlled by hydrodynamics and there'll be loop corrections and so on, but hydrodynamics is a controlled effective field theory. Uh, and so we can we can take this this uh, expression here, insert a complete set of states in the middle, and get um, a heavy heavy prime light OP coefficient in terms of a hydrodynamic two point function. And here in this correlation function, the the energy, the frequency, and wave vector that we're evaluating it at are the difference in energies and spins of the the heavy operators. And so there's going to be a regime where where hydrodynamics is applicable, and, and I'll explain what this is in a bit. Um, so that's the general idea. Uh, now I'll go into the details, and maybe if there's a question about the general idea, I'll, I'll pause here for a second. Question, please ask. If not, you proceed. Okay. Um, so I, I mentioned that ETH has a kind of thermodynamics part and a hydrodynamics part, the diagonal and off-diagonal parts. The, the thermodynamics part was actually already used in a, in an earlier paper. And I'll start by reviewing this, this paper by Lashkari, Dimarski, and Liu, um, which, uh, which ties some of the CFT data, basically diagonal heavy, heavy light OP coefficients to thermodynamic properties of the CFT. Um, so I'll start with this and then, and then show how we'll have a much more general expression for off-diagonal heavy, heavy light OP coefficients in terms of hydrodynamics. Um, so, okay, so, uh, Underlying all of this discussion is the is the operator state correspondence in CFTs that relates um, operators um, to to states on the on the sphere or on the cylinder. And uh, these these so uh, an OP coefficient is basically a matrix element of of an, of a, an operator, and I'll I'll view it in this way as a matrix element of a light operator in heavy eigenstates. And now these matrix elements are related to thermal physics. Um, well, they're directly related to thermal physics, but, but the, the, in the simplest way, thanks to ETH. And uh, I'll focus first on this diagonal part. So these matrix elements are approximately diagonal, and their diagonal part is, is fixed to be the thermal expectation value of the light operator. <clears throat> now, as I said, the temperature at which I'm, I'm supposed to evaluate this, this, expectation, this uh, thermal expectation value is, is related to... Um, to the uh, energy of these states by the equation of states. But in a CFT, the equation of state is very simple, thanks to scale invariance. And so it, it, it's uh, essentially fixed up, up to a number just by, just by scaling. And one way to, to fix it is, to, is to, to write the energy density on the sphere. So my space is a sphere and time, is, uh, time just goes up, so that's the cylinder. Um, the, the energy density on the sphere is given by the total energy created by the heavy operators, so that's delta over R divided by the volume of the sphere, which is r to the d up to some factors of pi that I'm dropping. Uh, that's the energy density. On the other hand, the energy density by scale invariance has to be related to temperature to the d plus one. d is again, the, the still the spatial dimension here, uh, up to some number. And this number I'll call uh, bt following a notation from, from this paper. So this is related to the thermal, um, uh, to, to, the, to the thermal expectation value of the stress tensor in a thermal state. It, this is where this Bt occurs. Um, okay, I won't write the indices, but it's proportional to Bt. Um, so, so this fixes the temperature beta in terms of the dimension delta. Uh, moreover, on the right-hand side, the thermal expectation value of, of the light operator is also fixed by scale invariance. Uh, and it has to have it has to have this form. Okay, it has to go like the temperature to the dimension of the this light operator again up to a number and this number we'll call b o. So if we put both of these expressions in here um, and relate it back to the op coefficient, the factors of radius cancel, and we get this nice formula for op coefficients that involves uh, the dimension of the heavy operator, the dimension of the light operator. And these two, these two numbers, B0 and, and B, B O and BT. So this is a really, I really like this expression because it, it, it's extremely universal. So if I pick, if I pick a CFT, this fixes BT. BT is kind of like an analog of the central charge in higher dimensions. Um, so that you know that's going to fix BT. And then let's pick, a, let's pick a, a light operator that that changes BO. It's going to have a universal, um, uh, approximately universal OP coefficient with all heavy operators. Uh, given by this expression, with the simple dependence on the dimensions of these operators, and uh, um, yeah, the, the dimension of the heavy and the light operators. 
So this, uh, this is from this paper, and this is how they used uh, ETH and, and, and thermodynamics to fix MOP coefficients. Now let's look at the off-diagonal part of ETH. So um, the, the off-diagonal part is, uh, is, is controlled by, by the two-point function of the light operator, again, in the same thermal state. Uh, so now, because it's off-diagonal, there are more parameters in the game. You can have um, uh, different, so you have two different heavy operators. They can have different dimensions, different spins. And we'll uh, work in the, in the so-called macro macroscopic limit. So we're taking their dimension to go to infinity. Uh, because we want a finite energy density on this sphere. Okay, so I'm going to take uh, their, their dimension to go to infinity and the radius to go to infinity and a limit where I keep the energy density on the sphere fixed. Um, and and I'll, I'll give some, and the results will be, will be in, in, in this limit. Um, moreover here, this, this correlation function, this hydramic correlation function is evaluated at uh, energy at a frequency equal to the difference in, in energy of the two, um, of the two states. So E minus E prime, which is uh, delta minus delta prime uh, divided by R. And we need, we need this uh, frequency to be, to be small, to be in the hydramic regime, right? We need it to be small um, in units of the hydro cutoff, which is this equilibration time. Okay, and in a typical, in a strongly interacting system, this would be temperature. So requiring, requiring this frequency to be small in units of temperature, leads to uh, uh, um, a limit in how different the dimensions of the two operators can be. Okay, so we're, we're basically going to uh, find results that apply for, for heavy operators, so large dimension delta, in the limit where their difference in dimension is not too large, but it can still be large. It can still scale with delta, but to some smaller power. So this will be the, the regime of applicability of these hydramic results. And there's a similar, uh, relate, there's a similar um, uh, window for, for spins. So in particular, they can have the same spin, but they can also have different spins uh, as long as it's not too different. Okay, uh, so, so um, now what we do is we simply use the correlation functions we had uh, to, to, make, to make predictions for this. So we had found for the, the stress tensor that, um, that the correlation function looks like this. There's a sound mode and a diffusion mode. In a CFT, these things are even a bit simpler because the speed of sound is fixed by the equation of state to be one over the, the spatial dimension. Um, the way you get this, by the way, is just to set uh, the trace of the stress tensor to be zero. Uh, this implies that uh, DE over DP is, is gonna be uh, uh, D, uh, let, me, let me get it right, yeah. Or one over D, no, sorry, D. And this is one over CS squared. Okay, so the speed of sound is, um, is, is, is one over is square root of D in a CFT. And the sound attenuation rate, so the bulk viscosity is zero in a CFT, again, by tracelessness of the stress sensor. So this fixes the, this sound attenuation rate to actually be given by basically the same diffusion constant. So the correlation functions look pretty simple. There's just one unknown um, parameter, which is this, the shear viscosity of the, of the CFT. So this is what correlation functions of the stress sensor look like in, a, in, in any uh, CFT in a thermal state. But what about an arbitrary operator that I'm interested in, an arbitrary light operator? Well, the strategy is, is the same. Uh, if it's a neutral operator, I can write an expansion for it in terms of hydramic excitations. So let's say you have me a spin L operator. Um, let me separate it into how many spatial components it has because you know, um, uh, uh, Lorentz and Rand will be broken by the thermal state and so it's, it's convenient to do this. So let's say I look at a component of this operator that has L bar spatial indices. Um, so this will have, you know, a kind of L bar spatial spin, and I can I can match the the symmetries of this operator using using gradients and using my stress tensor. And so the type of term I can write down is this this first term with with uh, um, some gradients and the stress tensor. I can also write down terms with more stress tensor, fewer gradients, and so on. So there's many operators I can I can write down in this operator matching um, type of equation. So now correlation functions of this operator will be given by correlation functions of this sum of things. And each, each operator here comes with a new unknown coefficient. Um, but uh, we don't need to compute them all. There's going to be one or, or a few that, that, are, that are dominant. And the way to figure out which one is dominant is again by the same uh, scaling trick that I mentioned earlier, where we had found that densities, um, in particular momentum densities, scale like k to the d over two. So in, in spatial dimensions larger than two, it's more advantageous to build up 
uh, this spatial spin using gradients rather than densities. So this first term will be will be the most relevant, okay? Um, and and the second term is also important because notice that at zero wave vector, uh, this first term vanishes, whereas this one doesn't. Um, so so you know, you might want to keep the second term as well. But but those will dominate the correlation function of this this operator. Um, so so this is what the considered relation looks like for an operator of spin L with L bar spatial indices. And it comes with these coefficients that we don't know, um, and that will depend on the operator. So if I if I change the operator, it's going to change these coefficients. So then I can compute correlation functions of this operator, and up to a few unknown coefficients, I entirely know the correlation function. I know its singularities. It's all a, a consequence of hydrodynamics. Um, and there's going to be a loop expansion as well, uh, and so on. And this uh, this BT that I introduced earlier. Uh, which you can think of as a dimensionless entropy density is a kind of loop counting parameter in, in hydrodynamics because the two point function of the stress tensor of the hydrodynamic field um, goes like it is proportional to this BT um, to, to, to times times stuff and so and so it's kind of the, the stiffness if you want of of, um, of this effective field theory and, and it's suppressing the, the loop corrections but um, but I want to stress that it doesn't need to be large for you to have a controlled exp expansion because higher and higher loop terms come with higher and higher powers of frequency or wave vector. And so they're going to be suppressed at small, at small wave vectors. So BT could be order one, like it is in say the Ising model um, or, or you know, regular CFTs, uh, and we'll still have controlled expansion. So this is what the correlation function of some arbitrary uh, neutral operator looks like in a CFT at finite temperature. Uh, and now we can simply use this in, in um, our, our formula to get expressions for heavy, heavy light OPE coefficients. Uh, I'll just show you a few types of examples. It depends on the, you know, there are many uh, OPE coefficients one can consider. There's many uh, indices to these OPE coefficients. Um, so in a, let me show a few, a, few, um, a few cases. So if you consider a light uh, operator that's a scalar, this will this slight operator will overlap with energy density and so it's going to feel the sound pole of uh, the CFT so here this is what the sound pole looks like in this OPE coefficient it has a singularity uh, when the difference in dimension is equal to the speed of sound times the difference in spin okay so this OPE coefficient is going to be peaked uh, when when the difference in the heavy dimensions and their spins are such that you you're on the resonance of the sound pole and the, the, the singularity is resolved by, by dissipation by the shear viscosity, or rather the dimensionless shear viscosity to entropy ratio of the CFT. Um, some other OP coefficients will be sensitive to the diffusive mode. Um, so, so this one is, is peaked at difference in dimension equal to zero. Um, it, it doesn't have sound. And it's again resolved by the, the shear viscosity of the CFT. And then there's some OP coefficients you can, you can find that are the same way that we computed these hydronic long time tails. Um, the, the leading hydro effect cancels, and there's a one loop effect, which is sensitive to a kind of uh, continuum of, um, of, uh, of two diffusive modes or two hydronic modes. And these have branch cuts instead of poles that, that look, for example, like this. So I, I have a question. So this spin yes. that you have talked about, the spin is any arbitrary spin or maybe it's restriction, some restriction is there? It um, it can't be too big, so the well it, it it can actually. It's just that you need to to change it a few things. So right now I have dimensions uh, delta and delta prime that are very big. Okay, I'm I'm in the limit where, where these things are big, and uh, the difference it can be can be zero, can be one. It can be biggish, but it can't be too big. So so there is this bound. Um, it has to be smaller than delta um basically delta to the one over d plus one spin is similar uh you don't want the difference in spin to be too big uh because again again that would mean a large wave vector and you'd be out of the hydramic regime so there's again a similar a similar bound but what about the overall spin and, that, and that's a good question so the overall spin let's say now we have uh, here the expressions i wrote were for an overall spin that wasn't too big as well so actually i also assumed j not too big uh, same, same, same bound, but but actually you could do you could consider overall spin to be to be large to be even a order delta, uh, you know it has to be smaller because of the unitarity bound, but uh, 
uh, overall spin of order delta. What this will correspond to uh, is from, you know, let's think of the state that this will create on the sphere. If I have a, an operator that's spinning so much. So delta leads to an energy, a big delta leads to an energy density, right? That's equal to uh, delta over um, R to the D plus one. Well, a big spin that's of order delta will lead to a momentum density. Let's say T zero X of order J to the R D plus one. And so in the limit where R goes to infinity, if I'm keeping both these things constant, what I'll have is a spinning fluid. So I'll have a fluid rotating around my sphere. Okay. And so you could do hydrodynamics around that kind of state as well, uh, and get you know things will look a little different, but the general the general procedure would uh, would still apply. Um, so you could even yeah. So you could extend uh, what I'm saying to also have j and j prime be um, be much larger than than one, um, and still but but yeah of course smaller than the unitary bound. So th those are the constraints basically. Yeah, I'll say I'll say a, a little more about the, the spinning case maybe. Um, so, yeah, so there's there's uh, a, a number of kind of cool extensions to to this idea. Uh, one is the situation where you have where you have uh, an extra global symmetry. So here I've kind of been you know thinking of say something like the Ising model where there's just uh, just you know the conformal symmetry and nothing else. But all of this could apply to other global symmetries as well. Uh, with with very little modification, but with some interesting applications. So let's say you have a, a CFT that has uh, a U1 global symmetry. Um, and, and let me plot here the spectrum of my CFT. So I'm plotting, I'm, I'm putting operators in the spectrum, labeling them by their, their dimension delta, their spin J and their charge Q. Here, the light operators, this, this yellow region is, is what we usually can study with the, the conformal bootstrap, for example, or you know Monte Carlo and so on. Um, uh, here, this is the unitary bound. Okay, dimensions have to have operators have to have dimension larger than j, and this blue region is is, is the region we can study with the analytic bootstrap, uh, and you know these which has these double twist operators. What I've been talking about is the region over here um, with with large dimension, where the spectrum is very dense, and you know it, I'm not telling you what the spectrum is. That would be kind of hopeless because it's exponentially dense. But what I told you is correlation functions involving um, two heavy operators around here and a light. But now if you have a global charge, uh, a global symmetry, you, you have an extra charge that you can uh, use to label your operators. And there's been a lot of interest recently on the, um, the, the, this limit, the large charge limit of, um, of the spectrum of CFTs. And uh, in, in, in some situations, it's expected that what this large charge state will look like is a superfluid state. In which case you have an effective field theory uh, that can make predictions about the spectrum and OP coefficients of the superfluid state um, semi-classically. Uh, so, so uh, and in fact, this was one of the kind of inspiration for for, for this work that I'm talking about. So, what I, what I'm showing is a is a kind of extension of this superfluid effective field theory to finite temperature. Uh, and what finite temperature means here, so here I'm kind of looking at things microcanonically, uh, you know, the spectrum of, of CFTs. What finite temperature looks like microcanonically is going away from the edge of the spectrum. Um, so the, the fluid I was talking about is around here, um, where I have, you know, large dimension and uh, maybe some background charge density. If I turn on a bit of background charge density, I'll have a charged fluid, for example. And in, in this work by, by Halloran and collaborators and, and other work that followed, they considered this, this limit, the edge of the spectrum, uh, basically, they look at the lightest operators at a large charge, and these these uh, create a superfluid state. But now you could take um, the um, the superfluid state and start heating it up. Um, um, and and what what you so by heating it up, I mean go away from the edge of the spectrum. And what you'll get eventually is an emergence of hydrodynamics in this system. Uh, so you'll have a kind of two fluid um, theory where you have the the regular the, the original superfluid and and regular hydrodynamics on top of it. Um, but if you keep on heating it up, meaning you keep on going away from the edge, uh, what usually happens in, 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 in most systems is that you, you restore symmetries um, by, by heating it up. Uh, and in particular, the, the spontaneously broken U1 is expected to be restored. So what this leads to is the, the expectation of a phase transition uh, in the spectrum of, of, of CFTs. Okay, There's going to be a point at which oper heavy operators 
that are also have a large charge no longer create a superfluid state, but just create a normal thermal state. Um, and so this, this transition is a kind of thermal phase transition in the spectrum of a CFT, okay, which didn't have anything to do with necessarily the, the, the yeah, it's, it's an extra transition in, in, the, in, the, in the CFT. Um, so uh, one, there's one uh, well-known example of this, which is holographic superfluids. So holographic superfluids are, are CFTs that you turn on where you can turn on a finite temperature in in uh, and we can study them holographically and there's a critical temperature above which you restore the symmetry and in uh, these these holographic theories this this thermal phase transition has uh, mean field critical exponents um, but this is because of the large n theory of the large n aspect of this of this theory which uh, which leads to mean field critical exponents but in in regular kind of you know n of order one cfts there's no reason to expect mean field exponents and these should be non-trivial um, phase transitions. So let's take an example. Let's say I start with a three plus one DCFT with a U1 symmetry. And I plot the spectrum, you know, I look at the spectrum of this, of this theory. Um, so I, I, at the large charge limit, I, I expect to have a superfluid state. And then as I leave the spectrum, at some point I expect the symmetry to be restored. And so since this is a, a thermal phase transition in 3D, uh, what we expect to see here is uh, Wilson-Fisher, the, th the 3D, um, you know, the, 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 the O2 model basically. Um, um, thermal phase transition in the spectrum of uh, so, so we'll have critical exponents related to Wilson Fisher to the O2 CFT in a three plus one D CFT. And uh, similarly, if we started with a, a, a two plus one D um, CFT in the, in the O2 universality class, um, there the expectation is that the phase transition is described by, K, uh, by BKT physics, so proliferation of vortices uh, of the superfluid, and um, it, it's a kind of um, uh, yeah, it's it's like a, a infinite order um, phase transition. So this is a, a kind of I think cool uh, picture of of uh, the richness of the spectrum of, of CFTs. Um, you can also you can also ask about what happens with spin, and that goes uh, back to uh, what I was uh, telling sand time. So you can you could turn on spin, uh, and then eventually what's that's going to lead to is a spinning fluid. And I think one interesting question to uh, to address is whether uh, how the transition to uh, the 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 um, the double twist operators or multi twist operators over here in the in the light cone uh, limit of the of the CFT uh, kind of thermalize and and lead to the spinning fluid the same way that here we can have a superfluid and heat it up it would be interesting to understand how one can heat up the multi twist gas to to get a a, a, a spinning fluid. And emergence of hydrodynamics. All right. Okay. So that's uh, all I wanted to say about the, um, the CFT. Um, maybe I'll pause here for questions. And depending on how much time is left, I can talk about uh, one plus one dimensions. So uh, I have a question. When you talk about the dissipative superfluids, okay. Yes. They are like how you uh, like. Uh, guarantee this fluctuation dissipation kind of thing. Uh, could you just tell about that? Yeah. So if you take a superfluid and you heat it up, uh -huh. there's going to be some some dissipation, and um, you know, what, uh, yeah, and, and it's going to be described by some form of hydrodynamics. So the the what, what's what's a bit different is that the superfluid is is weakly coupled. Uh, it has a the, the superfluid state itself. So the underlying CFT might be strongly coupled, but the superfluid, the fact that you have a superfluid phase tells you that there's a weakly coupled effective field theory here, you know, in terms of a massless uh, Goldstone. And, um, and because it's weakly coupled, the thermalization time of this theory will be quite long uh, because, you know, you're, 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 the superfluid theory looks roughly something like, like this, right? Uh, and so interactions are gradient suppressed. Uh, so there's a scale, you know, the, which is set by the density. So it really it's chemical potential to some power. And, and so to for, for it, so, so you can actually use this Boltzmann kinetic picture to, to figure out how long it's gonna take to thermalize. Uh, and, and you know, you'll, so you'll, you'll look at quanta phonons of your superfluid, they're gonna collide. Uh, and, and these will, will so this is gonna be, you know, suppressed by chemical potential. So this will lead to a thermalization time, uh, a scattering rate say, uh, that's, that's um, uh, very small, so it will be something like t over mu to some power. 
So at small at temperatures small compared to chemical potential, it's going to be to be very slow. So the thermalization time will be very slow. So if I'm around here, it takes a long time for <clears throat> uh, it, it, you know I have an EFT that's valid uh, for any time smaller than than uh, one over mu, uh, large any time larger than one over mu. But to see the emergence of hydrodynamics, you have to wait pretty long because it takes a long time to thermalize. But if you do wait that long, you can you have just regular hydrodynamics. You know, with an extra mode, the superfluid mode, uh, but it's yeah, it's dissipative. Uh, it satisfies the usual fluctuation dissipation, um, and, and so on. Uh, so you say that the thermalization is basically longer in this kind of cases. So yeah, is, is there is any way to uh, uh, like shorter the time scale of the thermalization? Some uh, techniques or tricks? Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, here it kind of is what it is. I, I, I think so. Around here, I typically expect it to be one, you know, to be order one in units of temperature. Okay. Uh, if the underlying CFT is is strongly coupled, uh, yeah, as long as it's not weakly coupled, uh, I, I think it's just yeah, it, it's kind of um, inevitable that if you indeed have a superfluid phase, that region is going to be weakly. That region. You know, even if the underlying CFT was strongly coupled, that region will have a weakly coupled effective description, uh, and so the hydrodynamics will take some time to to emerge. But it doesn't mean that you can't you, you can still make predictions uh, because you know the the cutoff of the EFT is still pretty high. The cutoff of the EFT is still mu. Um, it's just that the that um, w w which is you know the the only scale here in the game. So so basically Q. It's going to be something like Q, which is the the large number. Um, uh, but but the uh, to see hydramic features, you'll you'll have to look at very small frequencies. So in other words, you'll have to look at delta minus delta prime, quite small, smaller than what I said before in this in this region, if you want to see hydro. But but you'll still see superfluid stuff uh, at higher frequencies. Yeah, and uh, this is kind of a phase diagram you have drawn drawn here. So yeah, each phases has their own boundary. Okay, now yeah. I can yeah. understand that there's some kind of phase transition happening. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. We think using a single effective field theory can one able to understand these three different phases? Um, not really. So not not the one uh, not 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 um, hydrodynamics I'm using, <clears throat> because the you know in 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 the hydrodynamics that I'm showing you, you you basically. Uh, things like chem chemical potential is just a, a, a parameter in, in the in the theory, um, and and for example, if I'm in the superfluid phase, I would just tell you, well, there's an extra mode that you need to add in your in your hydrodynamics. So it's not like you can guess um, in the current theory that I'm effective description that I'm that I'm um, that I'm showing. You you wouldn't be able to guess the position of this line, for example. And I went, yeah, I don't know if there's a way to. Uh, I, I, this would presumably depend on the on the equation of states of the CFT. So you know now that we have both uh, charge and dimension, so this corresponds in the state to chemical potential and temperature. Now you can have a non-trivial equation of states. So your say your pressure or whatever, however you like to parameterize your equation of state, it used to be just you know by scale invariance a trivial function of t, but now it can be a trivial function of t up to an, a complicated function of t over mu. Okay. And and this will depend on the CFT. And I think that's a, like, yeah, I, I don't think so. For example, you could ask, okay, for the O2 CFT, what is the equation of state of that? And, uh, you know, probably on the lattice, we can, we can, uh, we have some idea of what it, what it looks like, but it, it's some non trivial function. Yeah. So according to you, so using a single theory, it's not possible to explain these three phases together. You have to consider different different theories in different different phases now the point is when you talk about the phase boundary i think uh, the behavior yeah. should match or something matching kind of thing will happen at the boundary how uh, people uh, assure that kind of matching at the boundary um means you have taken well, two to do different effective field theories you have understood yeah. different phases, but there is a phase boundary. Now the point is, they should yes. map at the boundary. I'm saying that how people guarantee that theory oh. 
much at that point. I mean, at the boundary, you'll have typically a second order phase transition. Yes. And there, um, yeah, so there, you know, things like the, um, the real time dynamics at that phase transition are, are, are pretty complicated. So there, it, it's, um, it's described by this theory um, of, of uh, Hohenberg Halprin. Um, so you have, in terms of the, the hydro, the hydrodynamics is, um, is quite different because you have new slow modes coming from the critical degrees of freedom, like the radial mode, you know, if you're, if you had a kind of Landau Ginsburg type, uh, uh, effective description of it. So the, 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 there is, so, so there's a lot happening. Um, and, and the number of light modes is changing. Uh, the, the number, basically the number here doesn't match the number there. And it also doesn't match the number at the, at the boundary. So there's a, a lot of crossovers happening. If you look at the real time dynamics of a thermal, Phase transition. Yeah, I, I, I think it's very rich. There's there's a lot happening, and um, but but yeah, I agree that you know things will. There's a kind of continuous way to, to understand things, but but there are modes that become light as you approach the boundary and that then go away. Thank you for the explanation. Yeah. Any other questions about the the CFT stuff? So you have fixed this uh, OP coefficient C, H, H prime, whatever. But yeah. what about the off-diagonal coefficients of the correlators, which is like R, H, H prime? How you fix that? Oh, oh good, good, good. So the, the, I, I'm, I'm talking about the variance of these things. So basically, okay, okay. Um, yeah. So, so, so I'm, 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 this, to, 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 I'm not exactly fixing all OP coefficients because that would be hopeless. Like, you know, the spectrum is exponentially dense uh, and these things, you know, what ETH says is that it's just a random number. Of course, it's not a random number because it comes from a quantum field theory, but, but it's still wildly fluctuating and it's hard to say much about it except for its statistics. So the statistics of these OP coefficients. And what I'm telling you is I'm telling you about the variance of these off-diagonal OP coefficients. So in practice, to, to measure it, you would take you would take a heavy operator, two, two heavy operators, a light one, and look at this OP coefficient uh, squared and average it over a few, say, you know, 10 heavy operators to get rid of the, to, to, to get the variance. Okay. And I'm, I'm making a statement about this thing averaged over a few operators. So that R drops out, R squared equal one. Okay. And there's only a smooth dependence on the on the heavy operators left through their frequency, how they enter in the frequency of the correlation. Okay, you may proceed with the next part. Okay. So in 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 one plus one d, I'm going to talk about quantum field theories because, um, uh, as I said, CFTs are are kind of too constrained in one plus one d. They have you know this infinite tower of of, of symmetries, and that um, is too constraining to allow for hydrodynamics. But also because we have more power in in one plus one d, we're actually able to say interesting things about about quantum field theories. And, and so this will be this paper with uh, Liam Fitzpatrick, Amy Katz, and, and Matt Walters from a few months ago. So um, the, the motivation for one of the motivations for this paper was uh, a, a bunch of conjectured bounds on thermalization and transport in, uh, in strong decoupled systems or that are even applicable more generally. Um, the first here is this uh, so-called Planckian bound on the equilibration time or the thermalization time that I already mentioned earlier. Uh, so we saw that in weakly coupled systems, it's much, it's parametrically larger than one over temperature. And the, the um, uh, conjecture is that it's actually never parametrically smaller than one over temperature. You can't be, um, yeah, you can't thermalize faster than this. Of course, a very famous one in the, in the high energy community is the eight over S uh, bound. And uh, this was generalized to a, a bound, a conjectured bound on, on diffusion constants. So eta, eta is an example of a diffusion constant. And this was generalized here to other diffusion constants. So what I'd like to ask is, do these bounds, do these conjectured bounds, can we prove them? Uh, and in particular, do they follow from, from general, you know, they, they seem very universal. Can we prove them from universal principles such as causality, unitarity, 
and so on. And there have been some um, uh, attempts along along this line. Uh, one was was from this paper that I'll, I'll talk about more in, in detail in a bit, which showed that causality leads to constraints on the diffusion constant in diffusive systems. So it's a bound that involves both the equilibration time and the diffusion constant. Uh, and in this other paper, we showed that the average null energy condition in, in uh, quantum field theories leads to a kind of uh, similar looking bound that involves both the equilibration time and the diffusion or the shear viscosity. So here I'll focus, uh, in this talk, I'll focus on this, this bound on the equilibration time. And what I'll show is that uh, basically all, um, all 2D quantum field theories satisfy this bound. So we'll be able to prove it. Um, in particular, we'll be able to, to get a precise expression for the right-hand side uh, that only involves thermodynamics. So the, the quantity on the left is a complicated real-time out of equilibrium thing, this equilibration time. But the thing on the right uh, will be very simple. It's only going to involve the equation of state of, of the quantum field theory. So, so 2D quantum field theories will um, satisfy this Planckian bound. Um, and, and moreover, we'll see that it, it, they're often... Uh, it, it often satisfies a parametrically stronger bound. So this bound, the, the quantity on the right-hand side will be typically of order one, but actually in, in many situations, it's gonna be parametrically large, uh, and namely both at high temperatures and low temperatures. So the way that we'll define quantum field theories is as by taking a, a, a CFT um, and, as our UV CFT and deforming it with a relevant deformation. Okay, so I'm gonna take an operator of, of my CFT and uh, a relevant operator, so dimension less or equal to two, and, and add this to the, to, the, to the theory. And so this will trigger a flow to uh, a new uh, IR um, point, which is either gapped or, or some IR CFT. And along the flow, I'll have a non-trivial um, uh, quantum field theory. And so the temperature, <clears throat> depending on the scale of the temperature compared to the scale that I introduced my deformation at, uh, I'll, I'll have different physics. And what we'll see is that both at high temperatures and low temperatures, this equilibration time will be parametrically larger than uh, one over temperature. Uh, so for example, at high temperatures, will be one can show uh, that um, uh, there's this extra large factor of T divided by the scale at which I, I deformed my, my theory. So at temperatures large compared to that scale, um, the equilibration time is parametrically slow. And this is going to be completely general. So I didn't assume that the UV CFT was weakly coupled or anything. And yet there's still a uh, slow thermalization. Um, and there, there will be a very similar result at low temperatures. Um, there the temperature is much smaller than the deformation. So at low temperatures, we can think of our, our quantum field theory as a CFT plus an infinite tower of irrelevant deformations. And the leading kind of thermal physics will be controlled by the leading irrelevant deformation, which will, which will give um, the, 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 the which will lead to this expression for the for the cooperation time. So, how is such a, a strong result possible? And why is the you know we have this this nice right hand side of the bound that I'll explain in a bit that only depends on thermodynamics? So, there's kind of two key things that make this possible. The first is the fact that the near luminality of sound in in one plus one dimension. So, the speed of sound in general is given by this derivative of pressure with respect to energy density. And as we saw earlier in a CFT, this is given by one over the spatial dimension. So in one plus one D, the speed of sound of a CFT is just one. Uh, so, so that's you know, one way to understand why there's no hydrodynamics in, in one plus one D CFT. But also if I'm in a QFT, that's a, you know, it's, uh, if I'm at high temperatures so that I'm, I'm close to the CFT again, the equation of state will approach the, the CFT and the speed of sound will be very close to one. So causality will leave very little room for hydrodynamic spreading about the, the 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 sound front um, because if if basically if if hydrodynamics emerges too soon um, spreading around the sound front will will violate causality because it will leak out of the um, the light cone so this is where we're getting a strong bound from the fact that the speed of sound approaches one both in the UV and in the IR because of the the nearby CFTs and so that leads to a parametrically strong constraint on their polarization time. The reason the bound is, is going to be so simple and only involve thermodynamics is thanks to large hydrodynamic fluctuations. So as I anticipated earlier, uh, in 1 plus 1D, hydrodynamic fluctuations are large. They lead to a breakdown of diffusion, and which is replaced by KPZ dissipation. So K to the 3 half width of sound modes. And in particular, a, a kind of neat thing about KPZ is that 
the analog of the diffusion constant, this curly D, is entirely fixed by thermodynamics uh, in a way that I'll explain in a bit. So it, it's fixed by the equation of state. And it's a much simpler object than a diffusion constant, which is usually very hard to compute um, and, and study, either analytically or, or, or numerically. And so what this means is that the width of, of, this, you know, of this hydrodynamic sound mode is completely fixed by thermodynamics. Um, and so that's why the bound will just involve thermodynamics. So those are the ingredients that go into um, deriving this bound. So there's kind of neat, um, this talk is mostly about hydrodynamics, but there's some, there's some uh, interesting thermodynamic stuff happening in this case. So I'll, do a, I'll take a brief detour in the hydrodynamics of one plus one dimensional quantum field theories. Uh, and in, in passing, we'll, we'll actually be able to, to, to uh, find an alternative proof of the C theorem, Zamologic of C theorem, and, and um, give a, a new uh, C function. Um, and then once we once we're done uh, with that, I'll go back to the hydrodynamics and see how we get the bound. Okay, so let's let's briefly talk about the thermodynamics. So the um, equilibrium thermodynamics is uh, is fixed by the equation of state, which you can parameterize, for example, by how your pressure depends on temperature. Um, so so for example, if I write down the expectation value of my stress tensor in the thermal state. By symmetry, it has to have this form. Um, the, the thermal state picks out the time direction, so this allows this first term, and otherwise it has to be proportional to the metric. And so this is how one can define energy and pressure. And they satisfy the usual um, thermodynamic relations that, that look like this. So here I don't have any other conserved charge. Um, I'm just going to assume that uh, I have a quantum field theory with just uh, um, Poincaré invariance. Um, so you can parameterize the equation of state either by, by using pressure as a function of, of temperature or energy density as a function of temperature. I actually like to use entropy density. I will say that it's a nice, nice uh, quantity. In particular, we can make it dimensionless by dividing by one power of temperature. Okay, so we're going to work with this dimensionless entropy density. So now let's, um, let's, let's briefly think about CFTs. Uh, this will mostly be about QFTs, but let me, let me just uh, mention what these things are for CFTs. So there, the um, uh, tracelessness of the stress tensor implies that energy density is equal to pressure in, in uh, one plus one dimensions. And so in particular, um, uh, DE over DP will be equal to one. So using these thermodynamic identities, I can write the top as TDS, the bottom as SDT, and so this is just the log derivative of the entropy density with respect to temperature. So what we learn is that the entropy density in a CFT is, is just proportional to temperature. Okay, this is not surprising by scale invariance. Uh, and it turns out that the coefficient is, uh, is just given by the central charge. This is the, the so-called Cardi formula. So in higher dimensions, it's a bit more complicated. This coefficient is what I, use, is what I called BT earlier. But in two dimensions, it's just the central charge. So in particular, S0, the dimensionless entropy of a 2D CFT is just pi over three times the central charge. Okay, so let's go back to, to quantum field theories. And now let's see what constraints we get from causality, uh, namely from imposing uh, subluminality of sound propagation. So I'm going to uh, impose that the speed of sound be smaller or equal to one. Um, so let me write this as one small or equal to one over CS squared. Speed of sound, as I said earlier, is dp over de. This is uh, de over dp. So here, what we showed is that in a CFT, uh, this is equal to one. Okay, the speed of sound of a CFT would be one in, in one plus one d. Um, but in, in in general, in a QFT, it's not. Uh, but it's still given by this logarithmic derivative of the entropy density. And now let me write this in terms of the dimensionless entropy density that I introduced above. Um, so I'll get one from the from, from t, d log t by d log t is one, plus d log s naught by d log t. So what we see is that causality, the constraint we get from causality, if we subtract one on both sides, is that the derivative of this dimensionless entropy density be positive. So s naught derivative of t has to be larger or equal zero. So what this implies is that we have a, a, a function, this dimensionless entropy density, which at CFTs, in CFTs, is equal to the central charge up to a coefficient. 
and which is monotonic uh, as a function of temperature. So if I plot it, um, and, and those are the conditions to get a C function. So, so basically if I plot it uh, as a function of temperature, at high temperature, so this is S naught, at high temperature, it's going to be equal to um, the UV because of the cardiac formula is going to be equal to the central charge of the UV CFT. And as I lower the temperature, it's monotonic. So it's going to decrease and it's finally going to settle to the UV, to the IR uh, central charge. Okay, so this is a, basically a two line alternative proof of Zamologic of uh, C theorem using a different C function. Um, so his, his C function was basically a two point function of the stress sensor. Here we have a, a thermal expectation value of the stress sensor. Um, and and uh, just using causality of sound and, and um, thermodynamics. Um, so let me illustrate this, this C function in, a, in an integrable flow. So there's some flows where we can actually solve the equation of state because they're integrable. Uh, using using um, uh, yeah using an integ integrability and one example of, of these flows is uh, the flow from the um, Ising CFT to the tricritical uh, sorry from the tricritical Ising CFT to the Ising CFT um, deforming it with this uh, this relevant deformation um, and so so here I have I have tricritical uh, Ising model and then the Ising in the IR. <clears throat> 2D Ising, and the whole flow is is, is integrable, uh, so you can actually get the equation of state um, numerically, but but very uh, um, uh, very precisely. And here, what I'm plotting is the the this this RC function, the dimensionless entropy density. I'm plotting it versus beta inverse temperature instead of temperature like before. So at uh, high temperatures, small beta, it's equal to um, pi over three times the central charge of the UV CFT, which is seven tenths. And then at low temperatures, it goes to pi over three times one half, the central charge of the uh, of, of icing. And you see, and the slope is related to the speed of sound. And here you see that the speed of sound is indeed always below one, and it approaches one both in the UV and in the IR. And you see that it's always pretty close to one. So you're always going to get strong constraints on 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 from causality because sound is so close to the like. So this is of course an integrable flow. I'm more interested in non-integrable flows. Uh, there, we don't have integrability to, to study them, but we, they can be studied with conformal perturbation theory. Um, so I'll, if, if there are questions, I can talk a bit about conformal perturbation theory, but otherwise I'll, I'll move on to, to hydrodynamics. So that's what I want to say about the thermodynamics. Uh, now let's go back to the hydrodynamics. So um, as we said before, we found that uh, when you have ballistic modes, uh, so like sound modes, uh, in, in one spatial dimension, this leads to large hydrodynamic fluctuations. And our way to see this was to look at this equation of motion for, for densities, like momentum density, for example. Uh, here, N, you could imagine N is momentum density or energy density. And we looked at nonlinear corrections to that uh, and found that they scaled, um, that, they were, that they were relevant. Okay. Um, so, so, okay, so this means that interactions in, in um, hydrodynamic fluctuations are relevant and our perturbative expansion breaks down. So we need, we need to find something else. Uh, and it turns out that this type of problem has been studied for a very long time, in the, especially in the soft matter community. Um, and it, it turns out to be controlled instead of the diffusive fixed point by the so-called KPZ fixed point that describes surface growth uh, in, 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 um, in two dimensions. And uh, the, there's a lot that's known about, about, about KPZ. It's not, as, it's not like diffusion where we know correlation functions exactly, but we know some things exactly. For example, we know um, how, uh, how, how um, frequencies scale with, with wave vectors. So there's this Z, this uh, dynamic uh, critical exponent that is different from two. In diffusion, it was, it was omega goes like K squared. Um, that one can get exactly. So here I'll just show you a quick argument to kind of guess what this Z is in KPZ. So the trick is to say, okay, we found that that um, these interactions were, were more relevant than the diffusive term. But let's try, and this week we got by scaling K squared like omega. But let's instead try to find the scaling of omega and K such that uh, we balance the, the time derivative and this interaction term. So we're going to scale the time derivative like k to the z. And this interaction term, it scales like k. 
times density, which is k to the d over two, so k to the one half. Okay, so this is k to the three half. So we see that to, to balance these two things, you need to have z equals three half. And this is indeed the, the exponent that arises in KPZ. So in KPZ, what happens is that these ballistic modes, they still spread, you know, they still have the speed of sound, but instead of having diffusive spreading, they have um, a k to the three half um, uh, with k to the three half dissipation. Um, and another very important fact about KPZ is that the diffusion constant no longer enters in the game. It's, it's an irrelevant thing. Uh, all that matters is, is the coefficient in this interaction. So in particular, this curly D, the analog of a diffusion constant, is completely set by, by this type of nonlinear terms, which is fixed by thermodynamics. Okay, This is a derivative of the speed of sound with respect to density, so that's a thermodynamic quantity. Um, so KPZ is, is, in a sense, simpler uh, because it's kind of the dispersion relation is completely fixed by thermodynamics. So that's what that's what hydromics looks like for one plus one dimensional quantum field theories. It has this weird dispersion relations. Uh, so we can find exactly this, this z as I as I mentioned before, um, and, and there's a lot of liter literature on this. Uh, the correlation functions. So before I had shown you diffusive correlation functions and sound sound modes, where I could just write the expression exactly. For KPZ, it's a bit more complicated. There's a scaling a KPZ scaling function that replaces the diffusion diffusive uh, correlation function. Um, and it's not known analytically, but it's known numerically to high precision. And uh, it, its limits are also known. So if I plotted it, it would still look very similar to diffusion. Let's say I plotted this correlation function, t0, 0, t0, 0, at, at finite, so um, at finite wave vector as a function of, of uh, frequency. So you would have two peaks, the two sound modes, at plus minus CSK, and the width would be set by this curly D K to the three half. Okay, so that, that would be the difference with, with diffusion. Um, and there's there's two modes because I have a, a right moving sound mode and a left moving sound mode. Okay, so this is what correlation functions look like in one plus one D quantum field theories at, at finite temperature. So now we can basically um, uh, get the bounds. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain this in a bit, and this will be, uh, inspired on on inspired by other um, works on on uh, the tension between emergence of hydramics and causality, and in particular this uh, this latest paper, and what they show is that it, it is so th they were considering diffusive systems, um, so so not KPZ but just kind of regular diffusion, and uh, they they made the simple observation that uh, diffusion, if you have a diffusive thing spreading, this is how the the front of this diffusive mode will spread. And so necessarily at early times, it's going to be a causal, which is, which is fine because you know, hydramics isn't supposed to apply at the earliest times. Uh, but this means that the time at which hydramics is allowed to apply better not be too early. Okay, so it's gonna give a, a bound on the, on the equilibration time. It has to be larger than this quantity here, which you can get by equating these two curves. Um, and this is the bound, this is the bound that you end up getting. Okay, so it's a bound that involves both the equilibration time and the diffusion constant. Now, in our KPZ case, we're going to get something similar, but instead of having a diffusion constant, we have this curly D, uh, which only depends on the equation of states. And so it's, in that sense, it's much simpler. Um, so there's two differences here. This was for a purely diffusive mode. Uh, we can do the same for a mode that, a sound mode that's also propagating, you know, uh, ballistically. Uh, so the, the bound will be stronger because now the mode is actually going, you know, prop with a finite speed of sound and it has some width. And so if we require that the, the, the kind of width of this thing not leak out to the light cone, you, you get uh, the following bound on the equilibration time. So here I did it for a general Z. Um, for KPZ, you would, you would set Z equals, so for KPZ, we have Z equals three half, and this will lead to um, D to the D squared, one minus CS cube. Uh, where one is the speed of light. Um, so here what we see is that as the speed of sound approaches one, this bound becomes stronger and stronger because your sound mode is so close to the light cone that hydramic spreading uh, would, would, be, would be quite a causal if it happened too soon. Okay, so this is, this is the spirit of the bound. Um, it's strong because speed of sounds want to be close to one in one plus one dimension. And it's simple because it only involves this KPZ uh, 
currently d, which, which depends on the equation of state. So uh, you can write it out. This, this KPZ curly D depends on nonlinear terms in, in, in the hydrodynamic equations. That's where it came from. Uh, if you spell it out, uh, this is what it looks like. So this is what the bound looks like. It only involves the equation of state. So you see that there's speed of sound and derivatives of the speed of sound with respect to, to entropy. But, but once yep. you talk about the nonlinear terms, won't that uh, yep. make the effective field theory somewhere? Because initially, um, initially yeah. you told that you were looking into the linear regime of the effective field theory. Uh, but uh, Yes, so it, it, it did break the effective field theory. That, that's why it's no longer diffusion, but it's it's KPZ. So the nonlinear term broke down the diffusive kind of effective field theory that I was using in the first part of the talk, yes. and it replaces it with a new dissipative fixed point, which is KPZ. And within KPZ, everything is is controlled. It's like the new yeah. It broke down the diffusive scaling law and replaced it with KPZ. Okay. okay. But the the coefficient in KPZ is inherited from where the nonlinearities came from. Okay. Um, so this is what the bound looks like. So let me let me um, uh, explain the various terms. So this first term is just kind of bidimensional analysis, and this is the Planckian, you know, the Planckian time um, in a system with no, you know, no small number, no small dimensionless number. You would expect uh, that's you know not weakly coupled, and so on. You would expect the thermalization time to be of order one over t. Uh, and, and this Planckian bound was to say that it was always larger or equal to that. And here we'll see that it's that it's uh, the case up to this factor. So this is uh, some some factor that only depends on the equation of state. Um, state. This is this uh, some function of temperature. Okay. And if you I know the equation of state, I know it. And in particular, this this um, this this function is uh, becomes parametrically large. Um, uh, at, at high and low t, because in both of these limits, the speed of sound approaches one. And then finally, there's a factor of the dimensionless entropy density. Um, so, so this thing is is uh, you know is going to be. Um, it, it, the, the, what, what this is saying is that this this bound actually becomes weak for theories with a large number of degrees of freedom. So if I have a large n theory, this is not a very strong bound. And there, there's a different uh, bound that you can get that's that's um, that's actually a bit stronger. And the reason this bound becomes weak for large n theories is that in large n theories, hydronic fluctuations are suppressed. Remember, I said at some point that loop corrections were suppressed by one over bt, or one over one over s naught. Uh, in this context, uh, they're, they're suppressed by the equation of state by the number of degrees of freedom. So in a large n theory, you have smaller hydronic loop effects. Um, you still get strong bounds from causality, but I, I, they're a bit different, and I, I won't have uh, time to present them today. So here I'll focus um, on on theories that have that have order one degrees of freedom. Um, and as I said, uh, yeah, and as I said before, at, at high and low temperatures, it becomes parametrically strong, and this is what it looks like in in, in, in these limits. So there's a uh, we, we see that quantum field theories are parametrically sub Planckian; they take a long time to thermalize. And their time, thermalization time is set by the dimension of the operator that deformed it away from a CFC. Okay, so that's that's kind of the the end of the second part. Uh, the 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 bottom line is that two D quantum field theories typically thermalize slowly because of strong constraints from causality. So there's a number of uh, kind of cool extensions to to, to this uh, idea um, uh, that I'll just uh, list over here. Um, I've already talked a lot, so so you, you might be already a bit a bit tired. But if there's any uh, uh, question on, on one of these topics, I'm happy to say uh, a few words. Uh, and otherwise, I'll thank you for your attention and for giving me the uh, opportunity to speak here and take questions. Thank you, Luca, for the nice talk. If anybody have any question, please ask. Shabdoshi, do you have any question or Kiran? Uh, no, sir. For right now, I don't have any. Oh, no, I mean, like, uh, like we discussed before with uh, science and science, like about this uh, causality in cosmology. So, is there some relation with that? So, this, uh, there's also a speed of sound in in the cosmological perturbations. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's right. Uh, 
Yeah, cosmology for many purposes has kind of features of a, of a fluid, a, a perfect fluid, but the degrees of freedom aren't necessarily the ones, um, the, the hydrodynamic ones. So usually, you know, you have like say a theory of, of, of inflation and uh, the stress tensor will have a kind of uh, perfect fluid form or, or, or something close to that. But you wouldn't, it, it's not the case that the degrees of freedom are always momentum density and energy density. So the, the way you actually compute things are, are a bit different. Uh, so yeah, there are similarities, but but also also differences. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Nagesh, do you have any question? Uh, uh, thanks, Anton, but uh, I don't have anything. Uh, okay. Thank you. So could you please comment on this uh, this connection with the swampland? Ah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so um. A lot of so yeah, there's been a lot of you know discussion on on, on swamp plans that I'm sure you 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 you've seen and uh, here yeah I wanted to make a comment on on the um, bottom up type um, uh, approaches so in particular you know there was this paper by Adams and and Limar uh, Kani Hamet and Rathadzi and many other people on on proving on showing kind of which I think changed our way of thinking of, of effective field theories a bit in that uh, they showed that effective field theories that not anything goes. So usually we just kind of write down all possible terms held by symmetries and say that coefficients are unfixed, but there are constraints. If you want your theory to um, to be UV completed by a Lorentz invariance uh, and unitary theory. And uh, there's been a lot of work recently on, on getting similar types of constraints um, from, you know, in various dimensions and, and so on. And here, what, what, uh, what, what causality in, 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 in 2D uh, gives us is a pretty nice uh, constraint on, on, of this type. But what's kind of qualitatively different from the existing literature is that the IR doesn't need to be a weakly coupled uh, quantum field theory. So in most of the literature, the IR is just, uh, it, it's an effective field theory. So that there's like a Gaussian theory, say phi, you know, grad phi squared type type theory, and it has interactions. And there are, version, there are other versions of this, you know, gravity is even something, it has irrelevant interactions. But here you can actually make a stronger statement in, in 2D. You can say that you have an IR, uh, a theory in the IR, which is equal to uh, some IR CFT plus a tower of irrelevant corrections of irrelevant operators. Okay, this is a very generic way to think about some IR, IR theory. Uh, and in particular, this IR CFT could be interacting. It doesn't have to be, you know, free boson. Um, and what we find is, is, is pretty interesting. So one generic operator that's always going to appear in, in uh, this tower of, of irrelevant operators is the TT bar operator. Yes. And in fact, it's, it's, it appears pretty soon, right? It has uh, dimension four. And it's going to lead to, um, uh, it, it actually turns out that in many cases, it gives the leading correction to the equation of states. Uh, so, um, so, so, so for example, it, uh, you know, the, the speed of sound I said that it was equal to one plus, and then you could do conformal perturbation theory and see the corrections from these terms. And if the, the, the first operator that's not TT bar has a dimension larger or equal to three, which is you know pretty, reason, pretty it happens a, a lot of times, then TT bar will give the leading correction to the, to the speed of sound. And it's not gonna be uh, sign definite. So it turns out to, to look like this, uh, the coefficient at lambda TT bar, and then appropriate powers of temperature um, uh, let me let me try to get it right. Uh, temperature to um, squared, maybe so, something like this, plus dot dot dot. And so what you see is that lambda TT bar and these higher order terms are higher powers in temperature. So you see that at low temperature, uh, sound better stay subluminal. And so this says that the sign of the TT bar term has to have the right sign. So this has to be uh, small or equal to one. So lambda TT bar has to have the right sign. And in fact, you can even get a, a strong. You can even get a stronger bound by looking at this coefficient um, has has the wrong sign, and so you can you can even get a, a non-zero value. But at, at the very least, it says that this lambda TT bar has to be has to be positive. So this is a, 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 a um, you know this this has had already been discussed in the TT bar literature. There's the so-called bat wrong sign and right sign of the TT bar term. Uh, but but this was in a, a different context because they were using integrability and 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 talking about you know, how the spectrum looks like as a function of this, uh, this, this coefficient. Here, I didn't use integrability at all. In fact, I have an infinite tower of irrelevant operators. It's completely generic. 
I, I only assumed that the leading irrelevant one wasn't too relevant. Otherwise, otherwise, this one gives the leading correction to the speed of sound, and it has the right the right sign. So when this happens, the leading correction is TT bar, and it has to it better be subluminal, so you you get a constraint on the on the TT bar coefficient. Yeah, very nice idea. So uh, yeah, a lot of people are working on this and this TT bar deformations. A lot of people I'm seeing. Right. So, uh, so you, you also working on this stuff? Uh, I haven't thought too much of the TT bar deformation in the context of integrability. Okay. But, um, but yeah, I have looked at a, a few of these. Um, a few of these. Uh, so, so for example, they have other bounds when you have JNT, JT bar, yes. and so on. And uh, and I think you can also get the. So there, there's also some sign constraints uh, that the uh, integrability I, people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Few of the people from Stanford also working on that. TT bar. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, so yeah. one of my, uh, I don't know you know him or not, Ronak Sony. You yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, I know him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's yeah, yeah, no, he's very nice. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know he's working on this. Yeah, I, I haven't. Uh, I haven't worked directly on on this uh, on the TT bar deformation or in holography or yeah, in these in these applications. Anyways, you have given extremely nice talk, and uh, thank you for giving. Uh, like, it's a very big talk. I know that, and thank you for your patience. <laughs> And no, no, thanks. Sorry, it, was, it was fun to give. Sorry that I have asked infinite number of questions. I usually ask this amount of questions to the speaker always, but uh, sorry for that. If you, no, it was uh, it was great. I, I loved the questions and I really enjoyed giving this talk. Yeah, because uh, like uh, I'm not an expert on that, so maybe sometimes I ask some silly questions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So okay. So thank you. Uh, it's very early morning at your place, I think. Uh, now it's all right. It's uh, now it's soon ten, I think. Yeah, but when you have started, it it was eight o'clock. I know. Was, that. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you that you have managed to do that. Yeah, well, it's late for you, so thanks for thanks also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah So I will share the link of the YouTube channel uh, once this is posted, and okay. uh, yeah, like. Uh, in future, once you have some new ideas, I will write to you. Maybe you will also write to us. Uh, you can give another talk whenever you want. Okay. Yeah, definitely. sounds good. Thanks a lot, Santan. And thanks to the others too. Thanks. Joining. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.